Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador suggests a pause in relations with Spain after denouncing that companies from the European country obtained contracts with previous governments, which put the country's strategic resources at risk. Brazil's Chamber of Deputies approved the use of agrotoxics, known as poison package, on Wednesday. At the end of her visit to Ethiopia, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed stressed the importance of humanitarian aid reaching those most in need and repeated the Secretary General's calls for a cessation of hostilities and the path to peace through national dialogue. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, in this RD News. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador of Mexico proposed a pause in Mexico's relations with Spain, at least until the end of this six-year term, as he considers that Spain companies have acted adventurously under the protection of the political power. Let's give ourselves time to respect each other and for them, Spain, not to see us as a land of conquest. Como tierra de conquista. We do want to have good relations with all governments, with all the peoples of the world, but we don't want to be robbed. It was a conspiracy at the top. An economic and political promiscuity at the top of the Mexican and Spanish governments. But it was like three presidential terms in a row. Mexico bore the brunt. They plundered us. It is better to take some time and pause, maybe when the government changes. Relations will be reestablished and hope when I no longer hear that they will not be the same as they were before. In Honduras, the eviction of Lenca inhabitants of the Tierras del Padre community is suspended due to the intervention of the Human Rights and Women's Secretariats. Earlier today, police officers batched in the community located to the south of the capital, Tegucigalpa, in an attempt to evict its residents after a court-approved order. The eviction will leave 120 indigenous families without a home if it were to be made. And the governments of Nicaragua and China signed a joint agreement related to the generation, transmission and distribution of electrical energy in the Central American country. Nicaragua's Minister of Mining and Energy, Salvador Mancel, highlighted that the setting into motion of these memorandums of understanding signed by both nations paves the way for profit after an investment valued in $560 million. Since the renewal of relations on December 9th between the two countries, the alliance foresees new investments of the Asian giant in Nicaragua, such as hydroelectric plants, solar power projects, and new electrical transmission lines. Until now, China also intends to support Nicaragua with the electrical mobility program, with the insertion of vehicles that use this kind of energy in the local market. In Venezuela, the Bolivarian Armed Forces deploy their troops along the border with Colombia to stop irregular groups that, according to authorities, are trying to destabilize the country and use the territory for drug trafficking. It is an unauthorized runaway in Venezuelan territory. In the place, a light aircraft, according to authorities. It was used by armed groups that have their center of operation in Colombia and seek to generate an atmosphere of terror in the Venezuelan border territory in order to expand their presence in strategic areas between the two countries. These groups are referred to as TANCO. We are in the Jose Antonio Paez municipality in the state of Apure in the framework of the Operation Bolivarian Shield. 
These are videos published by the Bolivarian Armed Forces in their social networks. They show the patrolling and deployment along the border with Colombia. They announced that they have located on Venezuelan soil drug traffickers' compounds and laboratories in the neighboring Indian nation. In the most recent operation, they found more than 5,000 explosive bars. All were deactivated. The armed forces of the Caribbean country began this operation at the beginning of this year, 2022, after President Nicolás Maduro stated that the strategy of the Colombian oligarchy is to infiltrate narco-terrorist groups in Venezuela. Venezuela is a victim of the Colombian war, which they call an armed conflict. It is a war. In Colombia, there is a war. Colombia is a failed state, and all this crime and all this violence, kidnapping, drug trafficking, murder, hired assassinations, all this has been going on for 50, 60 years, permeating the border, damaging the lives of the humble inhabitants of the Venezuelan Colombian border. Military actions continue and the Supreme Court of Justice has already ordered the imprisonment of 22 people captured due to their links with Colombian irregular groups. Now we continue to other topics. In Colombia, at least two people were killed and another five injured after a vehicle bomb attack registered in Infantry Battalion No. 21, Badle Pantano de Vargas, located in Granado, Department of Meta. The events occur around 5.30 in the afternoon when a motorcycle loaded with explosives detonated at the entrance to the battalion. And so far, no group has claimed responsibility for the event. Local officials repudiated the incident while detailing that the number of people killed and affected by the explosion may be much higher. The incident occurred 48 hours after a similar attack against the 30th Army Brigade in Cucura, north of Santander. Several regions of the country remain alert to the proliferation of such attacks. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Brazil's Chamber of Deputies approved the use of agrotoxics, known as poison package, on Wednesday. Deputies concluded that the bill sets a deadline for obtaining registration of pesticides in Brazil in a period that varies from 30 days to two years. PTS highlight intended to remove from the text the temporary registration of products already in use at the, in at least three OECD countries. Amendment by Deputy Rodrigo Agostino, the PSB SP, intended to prevent the registration of pesticides with substances that cause hormonal disorders and damage to the reprodu reproductive system or with mutation in the fetus or genetic mutations. In Bolivia, despite two laws sanctioning political harassment, the country has not yet overcome male violence against women in public office. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, tells us all the details. In their mind, men think that because of the strength that men have or because they have not had the same opportunities, women think that women are inferior. It is a social construction. Our parents and the environment often tell us that this is the way it should be. And the political harassment women suffer is not necessarily due to a lack of training for public service in government positions. Women are trained. In 32 years, Sedima has trained more than 48,000 indigenous women in social rights and political leadership. These women have been left aside in the organizations because they were dangerous and questioned what men were doing. The first law adopted in the country against harassment and political violence, which a decade later is still difficult to put into practice, came after an assassination. 
A councilwoman elected in the 2012 regional elections initially made a series of accusations against her fellow council members. We are talking about Juana Guispe. Her fellow councilmen did not summon her to the council meetings. They pressured her to resign. She resisted. She resisted all the harassment she was experiencing from the men until one day the body of councilwoman Juana Guispe appeared lying in a corner of a province. The murder of Councilwoman Juana Quispe pushed through the first law against political violence, but it was not enough. Another complementary one was approved, and it is still not enough. The Supreme Electoral Court and the Gender Unity Office registered 285 cases of which 130 are complaints, and there are 155 resignations. In Chuquisaca, we have one complaint under investigation, and there are five resignations. In La Paz, there are 13 complaints and 23 resignations. In Cochabamba, we have two complaints and 32 resignations. In Oruro, there is one complaint and 21 resignations. Data revealed that women elected by popular vote, when faced by pressure from their male colleagues, prefer to resign rather than fight for their rights. The most frequent pressure, according to the reports, is that man elected as a subject for a woman pressures her to resign to occupy her position. The pressure may be psychological, sexual or physical violence. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. Thank you, Freddy, for this report, and now we continue to other topics. In Kiev, a large gathering of demonstrators met in front of the U.S. Embassy demanding a peaceful solution to the ongoing tensions between Russia and Ukraine. During the demonstration, the Ukrainians raised their banners, asking the American nation to avoid the possible conflict with the Russian giant, stressing the use of its political power to solve this conflict in a diplomatic way. In turn, the highest Russian authorities will express that they have no intention of invading Ukrainian territory. After Russia has been seen to mobilize at least 100,000 troops on its borders as a method of defense against growing threats. At the end of the meeting, the demonstrators dispersed peacefully and no incidents were reported. Now we move on to other topics. On Saturday, about 5,000 people and 1,000 tractor trailers and personal vehicles in downtown Ottawa joined in anti-vaccine truckers' protests now in its 11th day. The so-called Freedom Convoy began last month as a caravan of truckers who planned to drive to Ottawa to express their opposition to a mandate from Justice Trudeau's government that requires them to be vaccinated against COVID-19 to cross the U.S.-Canada border. The city councillor, Matthew Luloff, said that the protest has turned into a more hostile and far-reaching demonstration against the government that originally planned and called it an act of terrorism following reports of protesters involved in assaults and acts of vandalism. The Ottawa what police have, for their part, denounced the inclusion of children in the protest, which has hampered the forces' response. Police on Thursday began arresting dozens of protesters who were camped out on the grounds of New Zealand's parliament on the third day of a convoy protest against coronavirus mandates. The arrests came after Parliament Speaker Trevor Mullard took the rare step of closing the grounds. Police calling more than 100 extra officers from other parts of the country. The authorities had arrested more than 50 people and had charged many of them with trespassing or obstruction. The protest began on Tuesday after more than 1,000 people driving cars and trucks converged on Parliament. The World Health Organization urged the rich countries Wednesday to pay their fair share on the money needed for its plan to conquer COVID-19, but urgently contributed 16 billion U.S. dollars. 
The World Health Organization said the rapid cash injection into its access to COVID tools accelerator could finish off COVID as a global health emergency this year. Act A, as the WHO calls it, is aimed at developing, producing, procuring and distributing tools to tackle the pandemic, namely vaccines, tests, treatments and personal protective equipment. The scheme needs 16 billion US dollars from wealthy nations to close the immediate financing gap with the rest of TB self-funded by middle-income countries. Act A has come up with a new fair share financing model on how much each of the world's wealthy countries should contribute, based on the size of their national economy and what they will gain from a faster recovery of the global economy. Vaccine inequity is the biggest moral failure of our times, and people and countries are paying the price. We know that unless COVID-19 tools become available to all, it is no mystery, infection rates will stay high and patients, health systems and economies will suffer. And new viral strains may evolve, posing a threat to all of us once again. So investing in Act A is the mutual interest of all countries. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. We have more news now. From race survivors to young businesswoman, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed spent the week meeting with some of the people whose lives have been cut short by the conflict in Ethiopia. In her statement after the visit, she highlighted the importance of having humanitarian aid reach the people most in need and repeated the UN Secretary General's calls for a cessation of hostilities and for a pathway to peace through the national dialogue. I also met with very many of the workers of the United Nations in partnership with Ethiopians in trying to get humanitarian aid and assistance to the people that need it most. And this perhaps is the biggest call that we have, is that that humanitarian assistance needs to get there yesterday. The urgency at which it needs to find, especially women and children that have been affected by this, is extremely important. As you have heard before, the Secretary General continues to reiterate his call for the cessation of hostilities. Um, in the country um, for us to find that pathway to peace through the national dialogue. Um, this has been a, uh, a journey of solidarity uh, with the Ethiopian people. It is one that we are convinced you will find a way and we will accompany the Ethiopian people to that uh, peace. Uh, then we can really begin to talk about the investments that we need to make in development. This is important in the short and in the longer term. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Philip Grandi, and the Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Antonio Vittorino, visited Agdas, a transit point for asylum seekers and migrants in Niger. The UN Commission for Refugees is also investing in strengthening the structure for the asylum system and providing support and assistance activities by seeking durable solutions, such as resettlement, local integration or voluntary return to the country of origin if security conditions allow it. Niger is a major hub for northward migration movements, which is growing and needs further support to provide security and opportunities. Migrants move to countries such as Libya, Algeria and those in the Mediterranean Sea. Known as mixed movements, these include journeys made by economic migrants as well as people in need of international protection or those eligible for asylum. Now we address other topics. Speaking to reporters in New York today, UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric said local health authorities together with the UN deployed two mobile health teams to provide health care to local communities and to the search and rescue personnel in Afghanistan's Kunar province in response to the heavy snowfall and avalanches in Dangam district over the weekend. Uh, moving on to Afghanistan, our humanitarian colleagues there are telling us that the res in response to heavy snowfall and avalanches in the Dangam district in Kunar province on February 6th, local health authorities together with the UN 
and our partners deploy two mobile health teams to provide health care to local communities and to the search and rescue personnel. Some 17 people were reportedly killed in the heavy snowfall in avalanches and many more are missing. We, along with our partners, are also providing cash, non-food items, shelter kits, and warm clothes to almost 2,000 people impacted by recent rain and snowfall in Kunar, Nangahar, and Langham provinces. The humanitarian response also continues across several other parts of Afghanistan, <clears throat> with 60,000 people receiving food or cash assistance in relief and relief items. The 2022 Afghan humanitarian response plan, targeting just over 22 million men, women, and children with assistance requires $4.4 billion and is unfortunately only 9% funded uh, at this point, and that's about $419 million. By the end of 2021, 180 national and international humanitarian organizations had managed to reach 19.6 million people in 397 of Afghanistan's 401 districts with some form of humanitarian assistance. The number of people reached is much higher than the 17.7 million people originally targeted due to a scale-up in the last quarter of the year and generous donor funding of close to $1.7 billion for the 2021 Afghanistan response plan. And we hope that last year's generosity is repeated this year. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.